Dr. Joseph Munzer. Dr. Munzer is professional of pediatrics and genetics at the Division of Genetics and Metabolism Department of Pediatrics at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he practiced there since 1993. He is actively involved in the diagnosis, management, and clinical treatment of patients with inborn errors of metabolism and mucopolysaccharidosis and the interpretation of tandem mass spectrometry newborn screening results. His clinical research is focused on the development of treatments for CNS disease in MPS patient. He has created the mouse model for Hunter syndrome, MPS2, and is currently the principal investigator for multiple MPS clinical trials. We welcome Dr. Joseph Munzer. Thank you, Terry, for the introduction. Certainly my pleasure to be able to uh, present an sort of overview lecture on both uh, ML2 and 3 in mucopolysaccharidosis. Here is my disclosures. I consult and serve in a variety of uh, company advisory boards. I, as Terry said, I'm currently principal investigator for a number of clinical trials related to MPS, uh, a phase 1, 2, and a 2, 3 interthecal enzyme replacement trial for the severe form of MPS2, a phase 1, 2 gene editing trial for adults with MPS2, and most recently, a phase 1-2 IVERT trial for San Felipe, sponsored by SOBI. And very soon, we'll be starting uh, interventional trials with Denali. Uh, and I'll talk about that study later. So what I'm going to do today is really give sort of an overview of ML2 and 3 and talk briefly about the clinical features, and then really focus the rest of my talk on MPSs, talk about overview clinical features, current treatment options, and then just a very brief at the end uh, sort of new treatment strategies that are, uh, are coming along, and you'll hear other some of this information <clears throat> in other presentations uh, throughout the day. So I want to focus on mucolipidosis ML2 and 3, or ML2 and 3. There, there are two lysosomal storage disorders that are due to deficiency of a particular enzyme that has the name N-acetylglucosamine 1-phosphotransferase. This results in both ML2 and ML3. This particular enzyme deficiency results in the inability of getting the lysosome enzymes to the lysosome, and what we have, have biochemically is high extracellular and serum activity of all the lysosome enzymes, and we have low levels within the lysosome, and therefore we have a, a clinical disease. Like all the... <coughs> Lysosomal sort disorder is either progressive with multi-system involvement, a lot of different organ systems involved, and, and again, within each of the MLs, there's a wide range of clinical involvement. This just shows you sort of that spectrum from severe to attenuated across the whole phosphotransferase deficiency, you know, from the more severe form, eye cell disease or ML2, to patients with ML3, but there's lots of, of variability across this. A you know, patient with ML2 uh, have profound cognitive impairment. They can have short stature. They have abnormal gums and a large tongue. Can have bone disease, you know, airway involvement, cardiovascular disease, joint. And unfortunately, in the severe form, they die very prematurely. In contrast with ML3, they have less, little, or sometimes no intellectual uh, defects. Can be cognitively intact. Uh, have less progressive physical problems, can have corneal cloudings, short stature, skeletal disease, uh, joint involvement, uh, and clearly have, some have an abnormal lifespan due to their airway and cardiac disease. I'm now going to switch over and talk about uh, mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, as we know, there are lysosomal enzyme deficiencies. There's 11 known disorders that comprise seven different clinical types of MPS. Each one is quite, quite rare, but as an aggregate, as a total, we estimate there's about 1 in 25,000 individuals are born in the U.S. with an MPS disorder. <clears throat> the hallmark of these diseases, and I'll talk more about this, are really the tissue storage of these glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs. Um, this results in progressive disease with multiple different organ systems involved. And as we all know <clears throat> from attending different conferences, uh, there's a wide range of clinical involvement within each MPS disorder. So what I want to do now is take this one sentence and really spend some more specific time and talk about different aspects. I'm going to first read it, and then I'll come back and talk about it. So MPSs are a group of rare genetic disorders due to deficiency of specific enzymes 
required for the breakdown of glycosaminoglycans or GAGs, formerly called mucopolysaccharides and lysosomes. And I'm doing this because there's a number of people who have maybe never come to a conference, and I just want to give them a particular overview of this. So in terms of genetic disorders, <clears throat> almost all of the MPS, except for Hunter syndrome, are, are inherited as autosomal recessive. What that means is both parents have to be a carrier. If both parents are a carrier, then there's a one in four chance with each pregnancy uh, that a child will be affected. It's important to note that carriers themselves are asymptomatic, have no symptoms, uh, <clears throat> and that if <clears throat> the two, two carrier parents have a three out of four chance of not having an affected child, but half their children will be carriers like themselves. In contrast to that, MPS2 is an X-linked recessive where we only see affected males. And so if, <clears throat> in the case of a carrier mother, uh, that if they have their daughters are never affected but can be a carrier where if they have a pregnancy containing a male pregnancy, then one out of two can be affected if they're a carrier. There's a number of families where the mothers are not carriers and therefore just by a chance occurrence that their child has it. MPS2. Females occasionally can have it, but it's for different mechanism and it's very rare. So we talk about these are specific enzyme deficiencies. So what is an enzyme? An enzyme is really a biological catalyst. It's like a piece of machinery. In this case, if you look at this where the gray is the enzyme and the yellow can be the glycosamine glycan, in this case the enzyme helps clip that or or break down that product. So, so these <clears throat> enzymes are important. They're very specific uh, for what they do, uh, and they're. You know, if we if you're missing them, this product doesn't get broken down, and things will accumulate in the MPSs. <clears throat> what we actually, what these enzymes are all involved in MPSs are the breakdown of glycosamine glycans. <clears throat> The next slide just gives you an example of glycosamine glycans are really chains of carbohydrates that typically are attached to a protein backbone, which is the brown in this. So the, these chains coming off are the different sort of groups of, of carbohydrates we call glycosamine glycan. Like anything else, they need to be turned over in the body uh, when they wear out. And so that's what happens in the MPS disorder. When you go to turn them over, you have an MPS disorder. You cannot break them down properly, and they accumulate and cause the damage we'll talk about. This process occurs within the lysosome, and that's why we, they refer to the lysosome. The lysosome is really the place of the cell that's involved in recycling. I hope a lot of you do recycling at home. You take stuff to, say, a bin in the garage, and once a week you take it to the curb and it disappears. Uh, you're basically recycling or reusing that compound. In the MPS disorder, what happens is you can't break it down. You put stuff in a bin but can't get rid of it. That bin accumulates, uh, and it basically overwhelms. And that's really what happens in terms of why we call these lysosomal storage disorders. And this just shows you an example of a, of a schematic of a cell, the nucleus here, and, and mitochondria. And normally, lysosomes really don't occupy a lot of space within the cell. They tend to be relatively small when they're working properly. But uh, the lysosome, you know, the major function, again, is recycling. Uh, if you have a defect, things accumulate. I wanted to show you this slide, just showing you that uh, here's a normal skin cell or a fibroblast. Here you show a fibroblast from a lysosomal storage of these patients, and what happens, all these clear areas are now where the lysosomes have been expanded dramatically. They're filled with material. This results in these cells not working properly. We get enough of them, these cells die, and that's this progressive damage we see in the MPSs and the ML2 and 3. <clears throat> The MPS disorders are really progressive. They cause cellular injury, which results at some point in irreversible cell and organ damage. So it's really, there's a lot of issues we're not aware of totally in terms of when this damage occurs, but it's probably much earlier than we used to realize. Here's a, here's a list of all sorts of different clinical conditions that occur in, every, in, in the MPS patient that vary from disorder to disorder. I won't go through this, but it just shows you that we can have all sorts of different problems from brain involvement to hydrocephalus to eye involvement to, to airway and teeth involvement uh, to heart disease. 
So this progressive gag storage causes cellular injury, results in irreversible cell and organ damage. We also then see a wide range of clinical involvement and onset of severity in each of the MPS disorders. And the next slide just shows you example that every one is either a patient with, with an MPS disorder from a child with uh, San Filippo syndrome to a, a you know, child with, you'll see again with MPS1, to an adult with MPS1, uh, to a teenager with MPS2, to a child with MPS1, to a, child, to a teenager with MPS6, to a child with MPS4, uh, Morchio syndrome, just showing you how the variability occurs from among the different disorders. One of the challenges for the MPS, is, especially now with newborn screening, you'll hear more about that from Barbara Bird in the next talk, the prediction of clinical severity is really limited for most individuals with an MPS disorder, particularly prior to any symptom. We can predict some severity, but in general, it's very difficult to know at age one or two, uh, one symptom develop, what the severity is gonna be of that particular child. One of the big challenges for the MPS disorders is really uh, the nomenclature well, uh, historically there was Hurler syndrome that used to be MPS, and there was a hunter form of Hurler syndrome. Um, McCusick in the early 70s really came up with a nomenclature. Now we basically talk about MPS1 due to a particular enzyme defect, iuronidase. MPS2 has had another enzyme deficiency called iuronate sulfatase or iuronate 2 sulfatase. Within the MPS1, there used to be different forms, and now we've typically talk about you know, severe or attenuated. Uh, in contrast, for MPS2, we have severe and attenuated, but in MPS1, Shea syndrome used to be in the nomenclature MPS5 until people realized that it really was a mild form or attenuated form of MPS1. In contrast, MPS1 and 2, where there's a single en enzyme defect for all the different forms, in San Filippo syndrome, there's four different enzyme disorders. Uh, a and B are by far more common, where C is, is much rare and D is very rare. <clears throat> Once you get beyond MPS 1, 2, and 3, the, the frequency is much less. Morchio is primarily a skeletal dysplasia, mounting bone disease, Morchio A. Morchio B is also that, but a very rare disorder, uh, MPS 6. Uh, is Maritolomy, where you have physical disease, uh, but not um, neurologic disease, <clears throat> and MPS7, or Sly syndrome, due to beta-glucuronase deficiency, is very similar to MPS1 in terms of its spectrum. So now I want to switch over and really talk about uh, <clears throat> the different clinical features very briefly uh, of all the common disorders. Here's MPS1, this little boy, Chris. The four-year-old in this picture has a classic look of a child with Hurler syndrome. You know, has a big head. If you could look close, he'd have corneal clouding. He has the you know, large tongue. He's got no neck. He's got an enlargement of his liver and spleen. He's got stiff joints. Uh, clearly, at age four, he's still in diapers and never really got out of diapers. Uh, the typical patient with MPS uh, one in terms of Hurler syndrome. Uh, or have symptoms before six months of age in the severe form and die very prematurely due to airway, cardiac, and overwhelming neurologic disease. Uh, it's an autosomal recessive disorder that I talked about earlier. As you'll see for all the MPSs, there's really spectrum of severity. In this case, we're talking about severe to attenuated. Severe patients you know, have severe cognitive impairment, lots of physical disease where the Shea patient can live a normal lifespan. Our normal intellect um, can have progressive airway, cardiac, and eye involvement, where in between, um, historically, you thought there were just three unique types, Hurler, Hurler, Shea, and Shea. In reality, it's really a spectrum. It's hard for me to know a Hurler, Shea from a Shea, and sometimes it's even blurred from a Hurler to Hurler, Shea. And so even though we talk about severe and attenuated, it's really two ends of the spectrum of severity for MPS1, and really for all the uh, MPSs have this range of severity. It just shows you two, three patients with Hurler, Hurler, Shea, and Shea. <clears throat> I show this slide because these patients all have virtually undetectable enzyme activity, so you cannot use the residual enzyme activity to predict clinical severity. Sometimes uh, DNA mutations will allow us to predict. Other times we cannot predict severity, and only time as what happens to the individual tells us sort of more the form. <clears throat> 
of the type of MPS. As we've heard, this is a progressive disorder. Here's a picture of a child with MPS-1. And if you saw that child, just look at the face, you would not appreciate that child has MPS-1. If you do a formal exam, you would recognize there's other features in terms of bony involvement, a little bit of cornea clouding, some stiff joints, where clearly down here at 39 months, it's pretty obvious that she has lots of evidence of uh, lysosomal storage and any physician hopefully would see this picture, would say that that's immediately a prior storage. But it's important that sometimes early on it's very difficult, and this is one of the reasons why newborn screening is so helpful. We can pick these children up before they have significant uh, disease progression. I'm going to now switch gears and talk about MPS2, or Hunter syndrome, efficiency of the lysosomal enzyme ironate 2 sulfatase. Uh, in a severe form, they have onset of disease between one and three years of age, so the severe Hunter patients tend to present a little later than the severe MPS-1 patients. They die very prematurely in terms of with airway and cardiac and overwhelming neurologic disease. Uh, again, we estimate it to be 1 in 100,000, but we really don't know the true incidence. Uh, <coughs> X-linked, it's an X-linked recessive disorder I talked about earlier. And carries really, carriers, female carriers, have really no significant disease. Worldwide, we do see a small number of females with MPS2 that have been reported. These are due to a variety of other mechanisms, not the standard adherence I talked about. Uh, but so a child can have MPS2, and so it's important not to ignore that even though it's a female. As we saw for MPS1, MPS2, there's the same spectrum of severe and attenuated, and here's an individual who, you know, who's probably about 16 or 17, you had onset of disease relative early on, had severe cognitive impairment, uh, and, the, and the typical child with MPS2 severe will survive into their teenage years. In contrast, attenuated forms have much slower onset of disease. They, they remain cognitively intact and can have a variable lifespan because some of the individuals can develop severe cardiac and airway disease, even though they're intellectually intact, die very premature. In contrast to MPS1 and 2, San Filippo syndrome really has four different enzymatic disorders, but all have very similar uh, clinical phenotypes or clinical pictures. The major manifestations are this uh, <coughs> cognitive or mental deterioration, hyperactivity with relatively mild physical features, and unfortunately, in the, in the, in the severe forms, death in the, in the teenage years. You know, this, Severe neurologic deterioration occurs in most patients with San Filippo by uh, 6 to 10 years of age. And now with the ear of DNA sequencing much more readily available, there's a number of patients who now we've been recognized in, in their late 20s and 30s who have San Filippo syndrome, uh, have a similar course that they're normal at first, slow down, develop uh, plateau in terms of cognitive ability and then deteriorate, uh, but occurs over a much longer period. And I, I have certainly met in a previously a 45-year-old with San Filippo uh, who really for the first 20 years of life had very little uh, clinical disease. So they're out there, there are adults out there with mild forms of San Filippo syndrome. This just shows you a three-year-old with MPS3A. Not a lot of physical features, you know, tend to have very abnormal hair, stiff, coarse hair. Uh, <clears throat> and there's just a, another child with, you know, a teenager with San Filippo, prof profoundly impaired, with unfortunate individual was, was, at the time of death was living in a group home because he liked to chew a lot. He actually accidentally picked up a rubber, rubber glove on, on the floor and was chewing on it and died of an aspiration. Uh, because he, got, he swallowed that rubber glove. <clears throat> In contrast to San Filippo, uh, Morchio syndrome, MPS4, uh, there's two different disorders, A, by far the most common, B, being very rare. Uh, but even A is quite is much rarer than MPS1, 2, and 3A, and 3B. The primary disorder where they're involved in the skeleton, they have normal intellect, uh, it's an autosomal recessive disease, and here's a 17-year-old sitting in a wheelchair, and that's not uncommon because of significant hip involvement, and they're also at risk for cervical cord compression, and they need to be monitored for cervical instability. Just show you some other children with MPS4, uh, short stature, 
one of the other common features, you know, delightful individual, intellectually intact, uh, but can have significant uh, dis hip issues, mobility issues uh, because of their bone disease. <laughs> MPS6 or Maritolome syndrome is deficiency enzyme aerosulfatase B. Have lots, can have lots of physical disease. It's shown in this child who's a, 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 child, a teenager, a young adult, uh, has normal intellect, can die very premature in the first and second decades of life due to severe cardiac and, and or airway disease. It's a rare disorder. We estimate to be one in 340, 350,000. Uh, who knows, again, the true instance of autosomal recessive disorder. <clears throat> MPS. Six is really like the MPS one and two. I showed you, and even the San Filippo. There's really a spectrum of disease. From, from the, this is a sister of the previous child sh shown, compared to an individual here who has very little facial involvement. Uh, examine him; he would be, you know, he would clearly have other features of it. But just shows you the variability. Tends to be earlier onset. Some have slower progression of disease. Uh, depending on severity of heart and airway disease, really dictate sort of. Uh, lifespan for the patients with Maritolome or MPS6. The Fly syndrome or MPS7 is due to deficiency of an enzyme beta glucuronidase. Even though I show two pictures here from the National MP Society showing MPS7, the most common presentation of this disorder is really this, we call it non-immune hydrops fatalis, is really a overwhelming accumulation of fluid in and around different tissues in the body in the early, in, in, either in, in utero at, at birth, and it can be typically life-threatening, and a lot of the children don't survive because of the severity of that. And then for the older kids, we can see very similar physical and brain involvement compared to MPS1. It's, again, it's probably one and a half million in North America in autosomal recessive disorder. Now I want to just talk about some current treatment options uh, for MPS, for the MPS. Unfortunately, there really is no current treatments for patients with ML2 and 3. So for, for MPS, the two current treatment options are hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, or HSCT. Um, people used to refer to it as bone marrow transplantation, or intravenous or IV enzyme replacement therapy, and I put not just enzyme replacement therapy, but, but IV since I've been working on interfecal enzyme replacement therapy, which I'll briefly talk about later. In terms of just the overview of treatment of MPS, for a long time we could actually treat fibroblasts with MPS for the following reasons. It turns out that fibroblasts and probably most, culture, most cells release small amounts of lysosomal enzymes, uh, and I'll show you a schematic of this a little bit, uh, that we initially referred to as correction factors. This was rec recognized by my mentor, Liz Neufeld. Uh, <clears throat> other people also then recognized there was a very efficient means to get enzyme back into a cell, and it was referred to as a mannose-6-phosphate receptor-mediated uptake of enzyme. This allows enzyme to, if it's outside the cell, to go in back into the cell and direct it to the lysosome. But probably more importantly in the MPS disorders, we need very little residual enzyme within the cell that is correction to correct the gag metabolism. We may need only 1 or 2 percent, 3 or 4 at most, uh, to give this. And we return, refer to this as cross-correction. If we get a little bit in, uh, <clears throat> then you can correct the cell nearby. And the next slide shows that. <clears throat> so in terms of, I'm going to give you a little cell biology now. Uh, here's a normal cell, and proteins are made like lysosomal enzymes are protein. They go to the Golgi, and a mannose 6-phosphate gets added to that, and that then gets routed in the Golgi to the lysosome, where it's supposed to function, and where when it gets to the lysosome, it, if it's present, it'll break down the glycosamine and glycans that are in there to be recycled. This process is not 100% perfect, and so some enzyme can actually escape out of the cell. And so that enzyme either has two fates, can either go into a near to the same cell back into it, or can go to a bystander cell, 
and correct that cell, that little bit of enzyme leaks out, and you don't need much enzyme. So in terms of transplantation, if you have a circulating white cell, it can, it can release small amounts of enzyme, go to nearby cells, and correct that storage in that cell since you need very little. I should say that for ML2 and ML3, what happens is that this recognition marker, this mannose 6-phosphate, can't be made properly and send the lysoenzyme to the lysosome, and they all get released and can't get taken back up and, and result in, in the clinical disease we see in ML2 and ML3. So this, is, this slide is sort of my sort of view of the treatment options for MPS. HSCT, again, refers to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or bone marrow transplantation, and ERT refers to IV ERT. So if you now just look at uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, it's really the treatment choice for patients with a severe form of MPS1 or HERLOR syndrome because we, in that disorder we see we see improvement in their physical disease, and, and, and for a successful transplant, we see stabilization for their brain disease or central nervous system disease. Certainly, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is a benefit for the physical disease and MPS2, but the, the jury is still out on how much it impacts the central nervous system. Certainly for older patients, it doesn't do as well. There's some, some patients more recently transplanted, much younger, and and that may actually be the key issue, or it may be that there's other factors that impact how successful transplantation is for MPS2, along with San Felipe A and B, where in general, we're not recommending that uh, for patients who have significant involvement. If you have a very early, very young child, then it's still, you still have the possibility for a transplant, but it's unclear what percentage and how much beneficial it'll be. Uh, transplantation has really not been beneficial for uh, for the morcio, since that's really a bone disease. Transplantation has been beneficial for Maritolomy or MPS6 prior to, prior to the enzyme approval is really the treatment of choice. But now with ERT, uh, we're not really transplanting because of the mortality associated with transplant. It's probably a five to 10% mortality in the best centers. Uh, in contrast, ERT now is available for MPS1, 2, MPS4A, 6, and 7, and people ask, why, why don't we have ERT available for San Filippo? Really, ERT only really impacts the physical disease. As we'll talk about a little bit. Enzyme does not cross from circulation into the brain, uh, and so people have not really developed it for ERT, even though I'm currently involved in a clinical trial. I'll talk about that in a second for San Filippo syndrome. Uh, but one of the keys for ERT, it really does much better at preventing problems than correcting problems. And that's where, again, newborn screening is going to be really hopefully help us as we develop newborn screening for more and more disorders. What are some of the treatment challenges for the MPS? <clears throat> IV ERT requires weekly infusions. It's clearly very expensive. There's patients with um, MPS 7 or excuse me, MPS6, where I'm aware that their enzyme costs more than a million dollars per patient per year. Well, IV enzyme, as I alluded to earlier, does not treat the brain disease. Since the IV administered native enzyme, that is the natural occurring enzyme, does not cross the blood-brain barrier. This is the artificial uh, sort of barrier that occurs at the lining of the vascular system in the brain, and it's you know, designed to really pr protect our brain. We really have no effective treatment options for the central nervous system or brain disease for MPS except for MPS1 undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. This is really one of the major challenges uh, that we have and what I've spent the last number of years working on will continue to work on in the future. Well, what's not clear is why the CNS disease is not stabilized in all the MPSs uh, similar to MPS1 after transplantation. It's really not known. Uh, it's not clear what the nature of that is, the timing of when the transplant is done, and maybe the nature of the enzyme uh, uh, deficiency, but there's still a lot to learn in terms of that. Uh, <clears throat> it's also important to recognize that bone disease, the corneal clotting when we have it, and carpal tunnel syndrome have not typically responded either to IV ERT or to hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So why I want to spend the last sort of five or 
five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, just talking about some new treatment strategies for MPS. Uh, I have a listed here. I'm just going to talk about the first three. I'm not going to really talk about substrate reduction therapy, anti-inflammatory therapy, or stop codon reach here for the sake of time. Uh, but, but in the future, you're going to see some of those therapies occur. I just want to focus on the top three, interthecal ERT gene therapy and blood-brain barrier penetration. Just to give you a flavor, you're going to hear much more about gene therapy uh, in uh, another lecture this, today. So interthecal or IT, ERT is really the direct administration of enzyme into the fluid surrounding the brain and spinal cord or the central or cerebral spinal fluid. So it's just that, it's just that technical term for what it is. So here's actually just a summary. It's a, you know, a list of all the interthecal ERT studies that are ongoing for MPS that are trying to treat the clinical disease, uh, the, the brain disease in the MPS patient. So there's for, ITERT has been used for spinal cord compression in patients with MPS1 and patients with MPS6. This is performed you know, typically in adults. There's been some suggestion of benefit. One of the limitations is that the enzyme, aldurazyme and naglazyme, have never been designed for intrathecal use, and you really can only give a small amount of enzyme because you have to dilute it, the aldurazyme or the naglazyme with artificial CFF to use. Uh, but that has shown some potential for helping decrease the, the cervical cord compression due to the very thick endura. ITERT has been used in combination with cord blood transplants or metaploic stem cell transplants with Hurler syndrome to try to improve some of the, the, the benefit after transplant where certainly people in Minnesota have seen a decrease in cognitive abilities after transplant. And this is one hope. And there, there's some data published coming out on that. Uh, <clears throat> ITERT has been used in patients with MPS1 with cognitive declines. Uh, <clears throat> ITERT has been used in, in San Filippo A patients using an interthecal drug device. This unfortunately has been stopped by the, the, the sponsor of Time Shire because they didn't see really significant benefit. Uh, it was a relatively short trial, uh, even though there are some families who may have benefited some. Uh, interthecal ERT is being developed for MPS 3B using a ICV, that is a device where the enzyme is not put into the lumbar space or the back of the, you know, <clears throat> or using interthecal device, it's using a reservoir that's planted over the skull and that the enzyme gets directly administered into the uh, ventricle, which has shown to be safe. I've clearly been involved for now at least 10 years on interthecal ERT for the severe MPS2 patients who have cognitive impairment. We have used, again, an interthecal drug delivery device and also lumbar puncture to promote that, to, to give that drug. I just want to give you an overview of gene therapy. <clears throat> In terms of gene therapy is basically delivering the normal gene that's missing in different MPS disorders into the patients. There's different ways to do that. Uh, in this case, we talk about the therapeutic gene. It could be the gene for MPS1, for example. You put it in a delivery system. This delivery system can typically be a viral particle, even though some people are going over to so-called nanoparticles. But the idea that you basically deliver this to tissues and hope that that, now, that normal gene can be introduced in enough amount to actually create a therapeutic enzyme, which can then leave that tissue and help others, other tissues in the body or cells. That's direct gene transfer. The other possibility is, is using similar to a bone marrow, taking bone marrow cells or stem cells out, infecting those with typically a viral vector, growing those up some, and then giving them back. So it's basically doing an autologous or using your own bone marrow to do a transplant. Uh, in this case, you're, you're increasing the number of the amount of enzymes being made in those cells to try to improve benefit. This last this slide just talks about sort of the different routes of gene therapy. One systemic or, or giving it physically, we can do intravenous infusion. Uh, there's clearly trials that are ongoing now with gene therapy for San Felipe A and B using IV administered AAV9. Uh, you can also consider, as I talked about, transplantation of autologous, autologous being the patient's own cells after ex vivo gene therapy where the gene transfer occurs in the laboratory they just alluded to. 
and a year or so ago, I saw some very promising work in an international meeting in Europe for MPS1, where using ex vivo gene, <coughs> gene therapy really showed a dramatic improvement in making enzyme compared to a normal transplant. The other possibility is to directly inject, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the viral vectors into the spinal fluid or into the brain. It's clearly an ongoing trial for San Felipe A, where there's direct interserial direct injection into the brain tissues uh, to try to deliver enzymes throughout the brain. There's also a clinical trial ongoing for uh, MPS2, a gene therapy trial where it's directed interthecally, but in this case at the base of the neck, uh, the, the, the AV9 vector is injected containing the MPS2 gene. So there's just examples of different routes and different trials, and you'll hear more in the future. There'll be more trials going on for San Filippo, MPS2, and MPS1. So the last general concept I want to talk about is blood-brain barrier penetration of proteins as a treatment for CNS disease and MPS. As I alluded to earlier, a lysosomal enzyme or MPS enzyme are glycoprotein that they contain carbohydrates. These glycoproteins really do not, they're large, they do not cross the blood-brain barrier in any significant amounts when we give them by IV administration. As I alluded to earlier, I'm involved in a phase one, two IV ERT clinical trial for, for MPS3A. You see how that shouldn't work. But what happened in this case, the company Sobe has taken the 3A enzyme, has modified the glycan or carbohydrate portion of the enzyme, which results in increased serum circulation, which in the animal model suggests over time you can get a little bit of enzyme in if it stays around. Normally when you give IV enzyme, it only lasts for a few hours. Unfortunately, this company is not continuing this trial, but uh, certainly the, the few patients who are involved in it appear to be benefiting from it. The other way to get things across the blood-brain barrier is to take the lysosomal enzyme and fuse it, couple it to a monoclonal antibody against a receptor that is a protein on the surface of the blood-brain barrier that then will transport that enzyme into the brain. And this is just sort of a schematic of that process. If you look over here, you have, in this case, the, the ligand or the protein binds to this receptor, and then it can be taken across and deposited within the brain, in the, within the spinal fluid, which then can then be taken up by deficient uh, cells within the brain. So this is a, a way to get an enzyme across the blood-brain barrier by using an antibody. <clears throat> IV clinical trials are in progress for both MPS1 and 2 with IgG or antibody fused proteins that recognize either the human insulin receptor or the human transferrin receptor on the blood brain barrier. So there's actually three different companies that have been involved in this area. Um, there's clearly a clinical trial that has in the past already happened with in, in Japan using for MPS2 uh, with the MPS2 enzyme fused to an antibody recognize the human transferrin receptor. Uh, and there's now a trial starting in the U.S. Uh, phase one, two uh, for another company involved in using the MPS2 enzyme coupled to an antibody that recognizes the transferrin receptor. So you may see some more. The same concept in theory should work for uh, San Filippo syndrome. With that, I really want to stop and thank for your attention. This was really sort of, I realized was overwhelming. It's just in the time allowed, I just could give you a brief overview of what's happening. I uh, clearly want to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak. I also encourage everybody in this time of COVID, a lot is happening. I really encourage everybody to vote. Uh, we need, <clears throat> there's lots of things going on in the country, and people need to sort of determine what we want the future to look like. And again, encourage you to vote. Again, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Terry.